Okay, everybody, welcome to the tertiary and quaternary protein structure video. Um, through, with this video, you should be able to describe tertiary and quaternary protein structure, um, draw an example that represents each of the different types, and describe protein folding in terms of um, Gibbs, enthalpy, and entropy. Okay, as a reminder, we've gone through primary structure, which is the sequence from N to C. Primary structure simply describes the order of the amino acids going from the N terminus to the C terminus. So A, K, L, G, G, R, Q, N, T, so on and so forth. When localized parts of the sequence begin to fold because of the sequence itself, this gives rise to secondary structure. I'll just draw a couple of secondary structural elements here. This might be an alpha helix, and this might be, if I do arrows up and down every other one, this would be an anti-parallel beta sheet. And this is secondary structure. Again, the primary structure dictates the secondary structure, so the order of amino acids dictates where the secondary structure is going to be. Now, if you remember in secondary structure, all the amino acid side chains are sticking out. So I'm going to put our groups. They're all sticking out. They're above and below the planes. The only thing interacting in secondary structure are the amide backbones when they're hydrogen bonding. So tertiary structure is when the secondary structure elements come together in three-dimensional space. Okay, so and it's the side chains that are interacting here because the backbones are already tied up. Okay, so tertiary structure is when the secondary elements, secondary structure elements, interact in three dimensional space. So where secondary structure, these were, let's say, neighborhoods. They're near each other in space. These tertiary structures are very far away in space. And the interaction is between side chains. Again, secondary structure is between backbone. And there's really only two parts to a protein. There's the backbone and the side chain. So if the backbone's tied up, all you got left over are the side chains. And again, there's still side chains sticking out here, having interactions with water. Now, if you get see two or more, let's do, let's just do two. Um, if you get two or more subunits, this right here is a subunit. Each protein is a subunit. If you get two or more subunits interacting, this is considered quaternary. Quaternary structure. Ah, let me zoom out. Quaternary structure is also stabilized through side chain interactions. but now it's just between proteins, whereas tertiary structure is within a protein. Okay, um, all proteins have tertiary structure. They, not all proteins have quaternary. Okay, so here's a nicer representation of this. Um, down here, tertiary structure refers to the spatial arrangement of secondary structural elements in the polypeptide chain. Polypeptide means protein. Quaternary structure refers to the spatial arrangement of multiple polypeptide chains. Um, so here is a single polypeptide. Again, we might call this a subunit. It's 
got a little extra non-protein piece on it. Um, but the tertiary structure describes the arrangement of these helices in three-dimensional space, where they are located relative to one another. If you put multiples of these together, you can see here's one in green, one in uh, yellow, one in pink, um, and one in blue. This is its quaternary structure arrangement. We would call um, we would call this a tetramer because it has four subunits. If all four subunits have the exact same primary sequence, we would call it a homo, meaning same, homo tetramer. If the four subunits had different amino acid primary sequences, we would call it a hetero, meaning different, hetero tetramer. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about how a protein folds into its three-dimensional shape. Okay, I like this figure a lot. I'm going to move it off to the side so I can draw to add on to it. Okay, so we're going to talk about how a protein goes from unfolded, the N to C, into a three-dimensional shape. I'm just going to make this... a. Uh one that has a lot of alpha helices. Okay, so this is unfolded to folded. Now protein folding is an overall spontaneous event. It has a negative G. If it wasn't a negative Gibbs, um, we wouldn't be here today. And there's a number of factors that contribute to this overall negative um, delta G and you should be able to describe all of the parts of it. Okay, so let's first start with the center. The center of a globular, this is globular, which means um, water-soluble protein, globular. The center of a globular protein is where all the valines, the isoleucines, the phenylalanines, the alanines, the tryptophans are. And those are all our nonpolar amino acids, and they are driven into what's called the hydrophobic core, by the hydrophobic effect right here. We talked about that in the hydrophobic effect video. This is where the entropy of the water is increasing, and it actually, um, in the case of a protein, right, in the case of a protein, isn't enough to outweigh the entropic cost of the protein folding itself. Okay, so hold on, I'm going to say that again. So here, the hydrophobic core is driven by the hydrophobic effect, where the delta S of the waters, the waters are being freed, free the waters, free the waters, they get to be more chaotic. So we get um, a positive delta S, which contributes to a negative delta G, because they take into account the minus T delta S. So remember, this is our, this is our seesaw here, and on this seesaw, the hydrophobic effect from the water being positive is not outweighed by the protein's entropy. So the protein has a negative entropy because it's being constrained. So the protein itself has a negative delta S because its movements are restricted. Now this is a little bit different than the lipid bilayer um, because a protein is a lot bigger um, and is one molecule instead of the lipid bilayer being lots of little tiny molecules that are hanging out together. So this part right here um, shows that the contribution from the entropy of the protein is actually increasing. So it's not helping us get to a, a folded state, or it's not helping contribute to the spontaneity um, of this folding process. So that must mean in order to get to a negative delta G, something else is going on. And that other piece, and I wish I had purple, but I'm just going to go back to blue, and that other piece is the enthalpy right here um, of all the intermolecular interactions between side chains. So I'm going to zoom out, and I'm just going to draw a few of these for you. Okay, so my protein is 
gonna do two alpha helices to keep this simple. Okay, so remember the backbone is all tied up. So the only thing that's left over are intermolecular or non-covalent interactions between the side chains. Now, um, for the sake of things, let's say we've got a valine here and a valine here. That's a van der Waals interaction. That is going to decrease or help contribute to a negative delta H. If I've got, oh, I am going to need a third. Well, no, I'm not. I'm just going to keep them all in the center. Uh, let's say I've got a four, one, two, three, four, NH3 plus, that would be a lysine, and, oh, it's hard to draw tiny on this, um, uh, an aspartic acid, there's a salt bridge between side chains, and again, that's a negative delta H. So every one of these non-covalent interactions that occurs between side chains lowers or contributes to a negative delta H. Uh, let's see if I can draw a couple others. Um, dot, 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 dot. Nitrogen, hydrogen. There's a, a Q here. Um, so that's a hydrogen bond. Again, lowers the negative, or, ah contributes to a decreasing delta H. So if I go back to my chart right here, we have to have a negative delta G. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here today. The protein folding has to be a spontaneous process. You're getting a little bit of help from the hydrophobic effect. Yay. Um, but you're actually having a big consequence from getting the protein to be constrained. Mm, bad. So the only other thing to outweigh the entropic cost of putting all the, constraining the protein right here is all the non-covalent interactions that happen between the side chains, okay? And this actually also describes why multiple subunits come together. So I'll put, let's put another NH3 plus here and and aspartic, another aspartic acid, only because they're just really easy to draw. So again, interactions between subunits is also driven by side chain interactions. You can also have um, quaternary structure three of them here, where the center of the quaternary structure is hydrophobic. So in this case, we'd have a hydrophobic core in each of the proteins, but then we'd have these hydrophobic faces of the proteins that also interact that could be driven by the hydrophobic effect. Okay, so I actually just went through um, quaternary structure, what interactions stabilize quaternary structure. These are all of the non-covalent non -covalent, um, and this is between side chains because the backbone is tied up in secondary structure. Okay, do all proteins have quaternary structure? Yes, um, peptides don't count as proteins, remember that. Do all proteins have quaternary structure? Nope not a requirement. Um, you can end the video here, otherwise I'm gonna spend one more slide draw, showing you how to draw these interactions so that it looks really nice and pretty because you might have to do it on a homework. Otherwise, you can stop the video here and you're ready to go. Okay, so here's my example um, of how to draw these Oops. interactions between side chains. This is very, very similar to how to draw the functional groups, but now we're just gonna add the side chains in there. So if you were asked to draw the strongest, I'm gonna put NC for non-covalent interaction um, between the two side chains, SC side chains, 
in the best orientation and proximity. Here's how you do it. Okay, so let's say uh, we have a tyrosine and a SN. So you do the exact same thing that you would for the functional groups. You would draw the parts um, that are interacting closest to each other. So in the case of these two side chains, it's a hydrogen bond. So I'm going to draw this dot, 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 dot. Um, I'm going to do it to the nitrogen, H2. Again, with the hydrogen bond, they have to be in a straight line. And coming off of this, you can simply do the side chain and then abbreviate ASN. There's no need to draw the backbone here. If you did, oh, well, here, let me finish this guy. So you would need to draw to the beta carbon and then you could put TYR. That works just fine for me. If you did happen to draw the backbone, this is what you must do. So again, I'm gonna do my OH, dot, 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 NH2. So I've got my hydrogen bond exactly where it needs to be. If you wanted to draw the backbone, let's call this alpha, this will be NH, C, O. You would need to squiggly line, so hydrogen here, um, squiggly line off coming um, off of this nitrogen and off of this carbonyl because now this is a protein, not a single amino acid. And what's on either side of this um, are the peptide bonds. So there's no NH3 plus, and th there's no NH3 plus here, and there's no carboxylic acid here because, again, this is within the protein, not the N terminus, not the C terminus, within the protein. So it's part of the polymer and is no longer what I call free amino acid. Carbon. This is hard to draw sideways. Squiggly line representing the polymer. There's a hydrogen. Carbonyl, again, squiggly line representing um, the polymer. I'll do just one more, just so you can see. Let's do, a, let's do an ion dipole. That was something that most frequently people were getting incorrect. So we'll do GLU, glutamic acid, uh, mostly because I think that you might not see the ion. You see uh, lots of other parts, but you don't always see the ion um, unless you see, yeah, I don't know why it is. The negative charge, sometimes you just overlook it. So we'll do glutamic acid and GLN, glutamine, glutamic acid. And again, I would give you the pH. Sorry about that. Let's just assume pH of seven. Uh, glutamic acid is negatively charged. GLN has a dipole, which means the strongest interaction between them is an ion dipole. So again, minus charge here. Make sure that you get the minus charge near the partial positive, which for this one is, oops, that could be better. Here, here, here the NH3 up here. So the partial positive is at this carbon. There's a partial negative right here. Oops, hold on. This should be an NH2, my bad. NH2, scooch back out to here. Hang back um, and then draw the rest of it again. You can simply draw the side chain up to the beta carbon and then just write GLU to describe the backbone. And then for this one, the side chain is coming mm -hmm. over here. GLN. And there you have your ion dipole. Okay. Uh, yep. Yeah. I think that's all I've got. And I'll see you in class. Bye.